Well, two weeks ago, we had the most televised event in America. Every year, like half of the people who live in this nation tune in to watch the Super Bowl. Well over 100 million people tuned in. And because the eyes of like the entire nation are on the screen at the exact same time, companies are willing to pay exorbitant prices to advertise their brand or their product. A 30-second ad goes for like seven or eight million dollars. If you want a minute long ad, we're talking about 15 million dollars. Just to tell people about what's going on. Well, this year, as the Super Bowl was kicking off, like in the most desirable time slot, instead of a company telling us about their new phone or about their new car, or instead of um, you know, someone telling us about this new movie that's coming out that the studios want us to watch, the He Gets Us campaign showed us a montage of people washing feet. And it started off with this picture of a woman outside of an abortion clinic who is washing the feet of a young woman, presumably either going into or just coming out of the family planning clinic. And next we saw a picture of a typical suburban housewife washing the feet of someone who is presumably an immigrant. And then the final picture that we saw was of a man dressed as a priest washing the feet of someone who has presumably embraced an alternative lifestyle. And to wrap up this montage of images of people washing feet, we had this iconic phrase, Jesus didn't teach hate, he washed feet. Now, I don't know if you've seen the discussion following it, but this specific ad was voted by far and away the most controversial ad of the entire Super Bowl. Like, there's over 100 ads, but this was the one that was most contentious, that was, had most discussion following it. Some people loved it, some people hated it. There was Christians who talked about it, there was a lot of non-Christians who talked about it, but a lot of people was t- were talking about it because there was something that's kind of challenging and, and interesting and provocative about the image of someone washing another person's feet. And what we're going to do today, as we continue in our study in the Gospel of John, we're going to open up to John 13. If you have your Bibles, you can get to John chapter 13. And we're going to see Jesus inaugurate the practice of washing feet. And as provocative and as challenging as it has been recently in our culture, it was just as much so 2,000 years ago. So let's see what God has in store for us. John chapter 13, verse 1, here's how our, our passage kicks off. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. So to set the stage, John tells us that the Passover festival was near. And that tells us we're not just in like early spring, so we know what time of the calendar it was. It tells us what time in Jesus' life it was. Uh, Passover, just so we're on the same page, was the time of the year that the Jews celebrated and they remembered their liberation from captivity all those years ago. 1,200, 1,300 years before the time of Christ, The Jews had been in bondage. They had been slaves in Egypt for centuries, and they cried out, and they they pleaded for God to to, to deliver them. God raises up Moses and sends Moses to the Pharaoh, and there's all of these plagues. And then finally, this, this final climactic plague was the death of the firstborn son. And all the people in Egypt were going to lose their firstborn son on that fateful night. But the Jewish people, they were told to take a lamb and to slaughter the lamb. And then the family was all supposed to be inside and consume that, that lamb in a memorial meal. That was going to be the, their supper that night. But the blood from the lamb was taken outside, and it was, it was painted over the doorpost, over the walkway into the house. And when judgment came that night, the blood of the lamb protected those in the house, and their firstborn son was passed over. So every year around this time, The Jews celebrate Passover, and they sacrifice a lamb. This year at Passover, it will not be one individual or one family or even a nation that is set free through through the, through the sacrifice of a lamb. It will be Jesus himself who steps into that role of the sacrificial animal. His blood will be shed to, to forgive the world for their sins and to draw us back to the heart of our Creator and our Father. That's what John is telling us when he says it's Passover. Now, next we see that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world, which means he knows that he just has a few hours left. Literally, this is Thursday night. 
by Friday, he will be nailed to a cross. So imagine what must be in someone's mind as they are nearing their certain end. A lot of research has been done by sociologists from people today, like what would you do if you only had a limited window left? You know you just have, have a few days, you know you just have a few weeks, what would you want to accomplish? This is how people kind of make up their bucket list. The second most common thing on people's bucket list right now is to travel the world. They want to be able to get on a plane ride and go see the pyramids and go see the Colosseum and go see the Eiffel Tower. They want to see the Northern Lights. They want that cool experience. The number one thing on people's bucket list is to run a marathon. Some of us are thinking, if I ran a marathon, that's how I would kick the bucket. Like, that's not desirable. But most people, if they think I've got a limited window, they want to do something fun. They want to have a neat, dynamic experience. What did Jesus do when he knew he had just the shortest amount of time left. Take a look. Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drawing them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What an unusual thing to do on your last night, to wash feet. Now, when we see this image of Jesus washing feet at a frank level, it, it kind of hits us as unusual because washing feet is not something that we do in, in our day. Unless you are someone who professionally gives pedicures or perhaps you're a, a nurse or maybe you lost a weird bet to your college buddies, we just, we, we, we don't wash each other's feet. Our feet usually get washed as we take a shower or, or that's it. But if we could go back several thousand years and just understand life in the village, life in a small city, we'd understand how necessary washing feet was. And washing feet was ubiquitous. It was, it, was, it was as common as you and I washing our hands before a meal because we don't want you know, germs on our hands to like maybe make their way into our body as we eat. Just like we wash our hands, they washed their feet. Now, imagine we're not in a large city that's sprawling, you know, 20 or, or 30 miles wide. We're in a town that's condensely packed, very densely populated with lots of people. And... You know, we don't have paved roads with asphalt. I mean, back then, a few roads, maybe a main road might have had bricks or, or stone, but almost every road was dirt. So if it's dry, then that there's a lot of dust. If it is raining and it's wet, then there's a lot of mud. Imagine also a world without indoor plumbing. So most people, I'm not trying to be crass, they would just relieve themselves in a bucket in the house and then dump that bucket out of the window or throw it out of, of the door. It relieved the, the, the house from the, from the stench, but it was just placed in the area where people walked. They transported their goods, not with semis and not with cars, but they transported their goods with oxen and with, with donkeys and with, with horses and all of those animals. They produce a lot of waste. And so the streets were filled with, with mud and with human uh, processed organic matter and with animal feces. And so as you're just walking through the streets, that's just on everybody's feet, everybody's. And then you step into a house and you get ready to dine for a meal. And you have to, you, you must have your feet washed. It was a necessity of life back then. It was so common. But nobody wanted to do it. Who wants to, to, to stoop down and touch somebody's calloused, stinky, waste-crusted feet? It was a task that wasn't just reserved for slaves, but for the lowest-ranking slave in the house. Nobody wanted to do it. There was no honor in this task. It was menial. There is a, a, a well-known researcher by the name of Christopher Thomas. He wrote his entire 300-page PhD dissertation on, on, on foot washing in the ancient world. And this was one of his pinnacle takeaways. Foot washing is the most menial task, unrivaled in all antiquity. It is the lowest position you can possibly take. And yet here we have Jesus taking that position, down on his knees with a basin and a towel, ready to wash the filth off of his disciples' feet. Now, with that in mind, knowing the context, maybe we can understand why Peter, one of the disciples, responded as he did. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? I mean, he's looking at this scenario saying, this does not compute. I, I do not like the way this is, this is going. Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, 
you shall never wash my feet. You shall never wash my feet. No, Jesus. It was very unusual to see a disciple look to his teacher, a student look to his rabbi and tell him no. You would not expect someone to say to their master, to their Messiah, it can't be this way. But Peter is not trying to be obstinate. He's not trying to be insubordinate. He's not trying to be rebellious. He's just saying, Jesus, you, you, you can't do this. The one of greatest honor can't take the position of greatest shame. That's not how this is going to work. Try to conceptualize, again, in our, in, in our world. Think about the person right now who you have the most honor or respect for. Someone who you think is like a 10 out of 10 when it comes to status and prestige. Now, for each of this, us, that might be a, a distinct individual. Maybe some sports fans from the 90s, like, man, if you could just spend a day with Michael Jordan, that would be awesome. There's a lot of Swifties in here, and you're like, man, if I could be Taylor Swift and maybe her tag-along boyfriend, that would be so cool. Or for you, you know, you're interested in the Pope, or you like J.K. Rowling, which it's your favorite author, your favorite musician, your favorite movie star, your favorite pastor. I don't know, it could be, it could be anybody. You shouldn't be laughing at that. It could be real. Think about the person who would be most exciting in the entire world for you to spend some time with. Now imagine you had the opportunity to have them over to your house one evening. You'd want that to be a great time, right? You'd want to serve them well. You'd want to bring out the nice dishes, bring out the nice silverware, prepare a, a great meal that they would enjoy. So imagine you're there, you're in your house. You have the person of greatest honor, greatest prestige that you can think of there with you. Now they, they excuse themselves from the table they're gone for a couple minutes, no big deal, but you get up to maybe fill up your glass with water or something, and then as you're walking down the hallway, you see this person, this person of honor, down on their hands and feet, hands and knees, and they are scrubbing your toilet. How would you feel about that? You would not want them there cleaning up the, the, the waste, the, like the, the filthiest part of your house. You would, you would be embarrassed, you'd be ashamed. You'd say, no, 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 this is like, stop this. That's what's going on in Peter's mind. Like, this does not make sense. Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. But listen to how Jesus responds to him. Jesus says, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Seems like a rather intense response. It's not like Jesus is saying, Peter, you just, you just don't understand it entirely. He's saying, this is a requirement. This is mandatory. I must, I must wash you or you're, go, or you're out. And what initially seems confusing and hard to understand, like it just doesn't make sense in the story, actually becomes the key to unlock this story and help us to understand the significance of what's actually happening in this moment. Here's, I think, a helpful way uh, for us to communicate it. When Jesus washed the filth from his disciples' feet, it symbolized something, and it symbolized him washing the sins away from his disciples' heart. There's something deep or something more meaningful happening. Here's another way that we could articulate it. The foot washing was a, a physical act that pointed to a spiritual reality. At this point, Jesus is saying to Peter, I'm doing something far more significant than just getting this dirt and, and waste off your feet, Peter. You don't understand. I'm doing something in your soul. I'm doing something to your heart. And because of this, Peter he stands in as a representative, not only of the other disciples. He's a representative of, of all people who will one day become disciples. And Jesus says, in order for you to follow me, in order for you to belong to me, you must be cleansed. I must wash you. And it's not like Jesus needs to come and wash our feet. We, we have, thankfully, sanitation and hygiene prevalent today. But every one of us has sins. We have selfishness, we have self-centeredness. Every adultery, every addiction, every act of greed, every time of concealment, everything that we have done that has marred our soul and, and stained us spiritually, Jesus says you must be washed. And this is Jesus lowering himself. This is, this is the reason why the foot washing happened at the Passover. Because it's going to be through his blood shed on the cross, that our souls are washed and our, our sins are taken away and we are purified, we are sanctified, we are made clean, we are made new, we are set free. It's a beautiful, intimate picture of the heart of Jesus expressed through the washing of feet, which is a picture of the washing of our souls. And then Jesus continues 
take a look a few verses down, starting in verse 12. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. So now he's sitting back down at the table alongside his disciples. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Now you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus is teaching his disciples, it's not enough for you to have the knowledge that I, your Lord, have washed feet and humbled myself. It's not, it's not enough for you to be inspired by my example and what I have done. You will be blessed, not if you know them, but if you do them, if you actually follow in my footsteps, if you actually use my life as a template that you, you pattern yours after, that is where you will find the blessing of the Lord. I love this picture of Jesus that we have in John chapter 13 towards the very end of his life. There's a lot of ways that we could respond to it, but there's three key takeaways that I want us to all grasp. So if you're taking notes, <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive into the first one. Write this down. Jesus was the first servant leader the world ever knew. Something we want to take away, that Jesus is the first servant leader the world ever knew. Now, I understand that that seems like a rather encompassing statement. That seems kind of bold. Like, is that, is that too significant of a claim that Jesus was really the first servant leader the world ever knew? I had the privilege when I was in college of working for a, a professor who was finishing up his PhD and his PhD through the University of Aberdeen, one of the top schools for theology around, it, it, was, it was focused on the politics of Jesus. And not just the politics of Jesus in general, but a very narrow area of study of specifically how Jesus as a political figure exercised his power and his influence. And so my job for a couple of years as a PhD research assistant was to get on the online database and catalog of every library in the world that had documents, like actual uh, literature from the time of Christ or before. And I literally had to, on behalf of my professor, like read through, through a translation uh, assistant, had to read every account that we have in all of recorded literature from the year 33 AD prior, of every leader that's ever existed and how they use their authority, how they use their power. And we can actually say with confidence, scanning every document that is known, that we have no recorded example, zero precedent for a person in power using their power to serve those beneath them. Literally, every example we have of people in power before Christ was someone who exercised their power in a self-serving way, in a self-aggrandizing way. And here's, my, here's my honor, I want it to grow. Here's my wealth, I want it to advance. Here's my, 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 my reputation, and I, I want you to, to, to bring glory to my name. It was constantly a self-serving approach to leadership until Jesus. And when Jesus enters onto the stage, he offers a Copernican revolution to the way an individual can lead. If you were to have lived 2,000 years ago, and while you got transported back in time, so did Google. If you went 2,000 years ago, and you Googled 2,000 years ago, servant leadership, there would be zero hits. That phrase did not exist. Today, if you Google that, you'll find 10 million hits. And it's because of the change that Jesus has brought to our thinking about leadership through specifically him washing his feet, which was symbolic of him laying down his life. For some comparison and contrast, let's just juxtapose Jesus, the king of the Jews. That's a title placed over him when he's hung on the cross. Jesus, the king of the Jews, with Herod the Great. The person who was ruling Israel at the time, who was also given the, ti the title king of the Jews. So you have two competing individuals, both with the same title, king of the Jews. You might know that Herod was the ruler over Israel during the time that Jesus was born. 
What do we know about Herod? We know that he was power hungry. He's called Herod the Great because he built great buildings. He built aqueducts that were tens of miles of long that, that brought in water from the furthest stretches so that people in the city could be nourished. That was probably a good thing. He built the temple. He built palaces. Uh, he built so much stuff, many of which still stands today. So he was called great for his lasting impact on, on, on the cities where he ruled. But he was not so great in other ways. We know that he murdered several of his wives. We know that he had several of his own sons executed. We know that Herod, being so like, concerned about reputation and image, he was uh, distraught at the thought of how people would respond to news of his death because he ruled so heavy-handedly over the Jews. He feared that when he died, instead of mourning, there would be celebration in the streets. So when he got near to the end, like this was like his, his final window and he knew it, he had his soldiers go throughout the country and round up the most beloved and the most like, notorious, uh, the, the, most, the most famous and popular people, and they were all arrested. They were placed in a cell, and he said, when I die, slaughter them all so that there will be weeping and wailing in the streets of Israel when Herod dies. That was the example of leadership that existed in Israel when Jesus was born. And here in Jesus, we have not just a contrast to Herod, but a contrast to how every leader with power before him exercised their power, not to serve himself, but in a humble way to serve others. It's a beautiful picture of the heart of Jesus, which is a window into the character and the nature of God. And I just want to ask you to consider, what might this mean for you as a leader? Now, God gives us all different gifts and different stations and seasons of life. He gives us all different things. But I would be willing to, to guess that almost everyone in here has a realm or a sphere of influence where you are a leader. Some at larger levels. Some of you have a spiritual gift of leadership, and you lead in your life group. Some of you have started companies, and those companies have dozens or hundreds or even thousands of employees, and so you get to help set the atmosphere and the culture in a really macro way, which is awesome. Some of you are, are married, and you're your husband. You're the leader of your marriage. Uh, you have children, and as a mom, you're the, the leader of that little, that little pack, and you set the environment in your home all throughout the day. Some of you, you're, you're a coach, and so you lead your team, or you're a manager, and so you have four or five people on your staff, and you get to be the leader. Some of you are a, a teacher, and you run a classroom, or you're an administrator, and you help to run the whole school. Some of you just have a network of three or four friends, and you're kind of deferred to as the one who kind of like rallies the troops and gets things going. In so many different ways, we have influence. We have been entrusted with the, with the role of a leader, and as you think about how you steward your role as a leader, are you leading like Jesus? Do you see your, your, your leadership, your influence, your position, your power as an opportunity to serve yourself, to have more comfort, to have more status, to have more honor? Or are you taking that position of a leader and the status and the honor and the influence that comes with it and divesting yourself of anything that would be self-serving and using it just to bless and enrich the lives of others? Because that's the, that's the heart and example of Jesus. Uh, just by virtue of being a pastor, I'm good friends with several other pastors. I'm really good friends with a gentleman who serves a church much, much larger than ours. And he was originally an associate pastor at this church, but then they had kind of an abrupt, unexpected leadership change, and he was asked by the elders to step into the role of, of, of senior minister and have this rather significant promotion. When he stepped into the position, they became aware as a church of a lot of things that they just didn't know before. And among the things they became aware of was that this church was tens of millions of dollars in debt. There was a lot of malpractice prior to his leadership. And so they had a lot of hard decisions to make. He had to carry a pretty difficult mantle for quite some time. But upon taking that role, uh, the elders wanted to give him a raise that would be commensurate with like, the level of additional responsibility that he was carrying and the extra leadership load. And he said, we, I, I can't take a raise. I'm here as a servant. Um, it doesn't matter what role I'm asked to do. Like, we're in massive debt. There might be some people that have to be laid off because we, we, have, we can't like, take out minus of credit to, to fund salaries. And so he said, I, I can't have a raise. And they conceded to not giving him a raise right away, but they said, we have to do something. So they gave him a $10,000 
kind of bonus, if you will, to just thank him for all that he was doing for the church with this elevated role. And when they gave him that $10,000 check, he went to the bank, he cashed it, and then with 10 envelopes, he put $1,000 in each of the envelopes, and he went to the mailboxes of the people on his staff that make the least salary-wise, and with anonymity, just blessed those he worked alongside of. The elders chose the right man to be the next lead pastor of that church because he didn't use his position and his power and his new influence to serve himself and to bless himself and to enrich himself. He divested himself to serve and enrich and bless others. That is the heart of Jesus. That's what he modeled. And that really sets the stage for our, our second takeaway. Not just Jesus as the first servant leader the world ever knew, but Jesus called his followers to become servants. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to do what I have done. In verses 14 and 15 of the passage that we've been in, Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus is saying, my life is a model for you to look to and follow. It's not just to get inspiration and, you know, feel excited and it's a, it's a template that we are to, to pattern our lives after. If you are a follower of Jesus, Jesus has called you to become a servant. And when we are a servant filled with love for other people, it, um, it transforms the impact that we can have in their lives and in, in the world around us. I remember reading a while back the story of Eric Liddell. Uh, Eric Liddell, that name might ring a bell for you. Uh, he was the Scottish Olympian athlete who competed in the 1924 Games. Now, I don't expect you to have a lot of, like, you know, 100-year-old Olympia, uh, Olympic trivia memorized, but he is the guy that they made the movie Chariots of Fire about. 1982, it won the Academy Award for, for very best picture, best, best, best playwright. I mean, won several awards. Uh, this is the guy who gave us that well-known quote, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. So this is Eric Liddell. People know that he was an Olympic athlete if they, they know the name or they've seen the movie or they read the biography, but a lot of people don't know his broader life, his deep Christian convictions. Because he was so committed to Christ and he had this, this belief that a Christian shouldn't be working on Sunday, which was you know, the day of rest and the day of worship, he gets to the, the Olympics in 1924 and they put his meat on a Sunday. He asks them to change it, they won't, so he doesn't even get to run his meat. He ends up running in a meet he, he never trained for, and it's in that meet that he won the gold medal. After he wins that gold medal, he returns uh, to, to Scotland, his, his home country, and he is celebrated. I mean, so much fanfare. He, he is, he's famous. There's fortune kind of heaped upon him. But instead of, like, pressing into that and just enjoying it and living it up, he moved to China as a Christian missionary. He moves to China, he's there for 18 years, serving in the shadows. He's, he's married, he's got kids, but then World War II begins, and you just kind of understand the geopolitical shifts and movement and, and, and the threats that are happening with China and Japan. Ultimately, it gets so dangerous that Eric sends his wife and his children home. But he's like, I'm here to serve. I, I, I can't, when it gets hard, and the people I'm here serving need me most, I can't just leave to take care of myself, so he stays there. Ultimately, Japan encroaches upon the area in China that he was living. He gets put in an internment camp. Quickly, he, sits, he suffers from malnutrition and disease. But even with his body like, depleted, he starts caring for the medical needs of other people in the camp. He, he starts a school to educate the children that are prisoners there as well. Ultimately, Winston Churchill, the Winston Churchill, hears about Eric Liddell's situation, their Olympic hero, and he personally sets up a prisoner exchange for Eric. We've got to bring our hometown hero back. Eric hears about this. The whole process is going through smoothly. And literally right before he's getting ready to step into freedom, he takes a pregnant woman and on his own authority without consulting anyone, had her go ahead of him. He stayed in the camp. Two people were set free. He saved mom's life and the baby's life. Weeks later, he himself died. Some hear that story and they're just like befuddled. They're just confused. Why would you not press into the fame? Why would you go to China 
serve in the shadows as a missionary for 20 years? Why would you not like, go to safety when you saw the threat approaching? Why, when you had a chance from Winston Churchill to save your life that was orchestrated for you, would you not claim it? And the answer is all about Jesus. He looked to Jesus, a leader who took the lowest position, a leader who served, a leader who laid down his life, and he said, that is my example, that is my model. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I will live and love like him. I'm guessing no one else here knows the names of any other Olympic athletes from the 1920s, or 30s, or 40s, or 50s, or 60s. Like, we have forgotten almost everybody. We don't know his time. I don't know his time, but we know the life that he lived. You leave a legacy when you live a life of love. I was talking to one of my good friends in this church who works at a dental office. We were talking just this week, and he was sharing that one of his coworkers uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and recently, I mean, just in the last week or two, had to have surgery to remove the cancer. And the surgery went well. She's on the path to recovery, but there's just some, you know, some complications that come with just healing and, and rest and getting, getting strength back. And he was telling me that one of this lady's coworkers who has the same role at the office as the one who had cancer, she willingly gave up all of her vacation time this year and gave it to her, her colleague who's at home healing so that she can like, rest and recover without worry about some of the financial consequences. And I said, let me guess, she's a Christian. And he said, oh yeah, she loves Jesus and everyone in the office knows it. What a practical way of saying, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to divest myself so I can serve, bless, and enrich those around me. When the followers of Jesus do that, it makes an incredible difference. And that really sets us up for the third takeaway from our passage. Becoming a servant allows people to see Jesus in your life. It's not just that Jesus was the first servant world the world ever knew, the first servant leader the world ever knew. It's not just that, that he called us to become servants. When we serve, people get to see Jesus in us. At the end of John chapter 13, we haven't read this yet, but I want to take you to this passage, John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says to his disciples, the same one whose feet he just washed, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus says it's all about love. And love is what compels someone to pick up the basin and the towel. Love is what, is what energizes someone to get down on their knees and to serve in the lowly ways. It's not duty. It's not obligation. It's not another task you have to check off your list. It's love that moves us to serve. And Jesus says it's love that's going to give people the, the, the knowledge that he is real and that he changes lives today. When, when people today conceptualize love, when they talk about love and they say, I'm in love, I'm not trying to be demeaning to, to, to folks, but oftentimes what that phrase means is I love you or I'm in love, it means that I feel something on the inside of me that's like tingly and exciting when I think about you or I am in your presence. Or when you do things that I like, I feel good, so I love you. And just at a frank level, just kind of like analyze it. That's not love. That's need. That's saying when this profits me and I enjoy it, I like it, and so I say that I love it. Real love has a very different quality to it. And you can love someone and feel great on the inside. I mean, there's biological things and chemical things and dopamine, and that's kind of just like part of the equation to like the way God made us and the way we're wired. But real love has nothing to do with how you feel on the inside and getting excited and having tingles. Real love is when you, when you see another person's life and you are willing to do whatever it takes to see the ultimate best come about in their life regardless of self-interest and regardless of the cost. Ultimate love comes when, with the help of God, you're able to see someone like through the lens of Jesus. And as you see that other person through the lens of Jesus, you, you even get like a bit of a picture or an image of God's glorious future in their life. Like, like the wonderful, grace-filled things he wants to accomplish in and through them. And then catching a vision of their glorious future, you say, God, I am your servant. Anything I have, all that I am, is available to be used by you to bless and serve them to see your glorious future become a reality. 
That's love. That mo- that's what moves us to the basin and the towel. That's what moves us to serve in the shadows, in the, the, the least glamorous and the most non-exciting ways. Only love can compel us to that. But when we love that way, the world sees Jesus in us. A while back, when I still lived in Kentucky, so this would have been like seven or eight years ago, I was at a party, and maybe like 100 people in this, in this house. It was, it was pretty packed. I maybe knew like half the people there. I didn't know the other half. I was just standing there uh, by the stairwell. I can remember exactly where I was at, and I was nursing a Dr. Pepper, as I oftentimes do. And this gentleman came up to me, and he introduced himself, and he said, uh, we don't know each other, but I know your wife's family. I was like, oh, you know the Hendersons? That's so cool. I said, how do you know them? And he said, well, I worship at the same church that they do. And I was like, cool. Like, tell me about that. And he said that he was from China. And that was helpful context because with his accent and just like some things about his mannerisms, I could tell like he was not from America. And he said he came over here to do some stuff at the University of, of Kentucky. And he got connected to my wife's family and started attending their church. And so I was like, this is so neat. I said, well, tell me, like, growing up in China, how'd you become a Christian? And he said, oh, I, I'm, I'm not a Christian, I'm an atheist. I said, oh, okay, well, then why are you attending, like, like my wife's family's church? And he's like, well, when I first got to America, I had a very tough time, and basically everyone ignored me. I had no one to help me, no one to assist me, no one to give me a ride. Like, I was just in kind of a, a lonely and difficult place. And then somehow or another, I started meeting people in your wife's family. And they honored me, and they dignified me, and they had conversations with me, and they offered me rides, and they even invited me to spend time with, with them for the holidays and like, for meals at their house. And they just are really kind and really loving. And then so they invited me to their church, and so I've started attending their church, and I'm really kind of interested in this Christianity thing. And, and right now I'm trying to figure out if like, I want to maintain my conviction as an atheist or believe in Jesus. I was like, this is, this is cool. So I could tell by the way he was dialoguing that he was very open with this conversation. Like he, he, he wasn't overly sensitive. And so I just like, well, tell me, like, as you are thinking about it, what is the most compelling reason to stand on your current convictions and believe that atheism is right? And after sharing like the best reason for that, what do you think is the very best reason to convert? And what's the best compelling evidence to think that Christianity is right? And so he thought on it for three or four seconds, and he said, the best, most compelling reason that atheism is, is right is that everything re- revolving around faith just seems so geographically predetermined. He said, I grew up in China. Everyone I knew was an atheist, so I became an atheist. I spent some time here in America. A lot of people believe in God, so now I'm considering believing in God. Like, is it all just predetermined based upon where you live and what country you're born in? He said, that's the best reason to become an atheist. He said, the best reason to become a Christian The best evidence that that God is real is your wife's family and the church they worship at and the way they love me. They really love me in a way I've never been loved before and it makes me think that God might be real. About nine months after that conversation, he was baptized, decided to become a Christian. I remember standing in that house, at that party, all the hustle and bustle going around, just thinking to myself as he was saying this, John 13 is alive and active. Here's this non-believer, grew up an atheist, who's wrestling with his convictions and his non-Christ-centered worldview, and the reasons he's wrestling with it is because people who love Jesus loved him. The world has changed. Eternity gets altered when, when you who have been loved by Jesus and served by Jesus in the most meaningful, all possible ways, decide, not in your own strength, but in the strength of the Holy Spirit, to love and serve others. That's how we take this passage home. Yes, we can be inspired that Jesus is the greatest servant leader ever, and we can think about that at a historical level and how significant it is. And we can think about our own leadership and wanting to become servants. But really, when we step into that mode of selfless love, that's how lives are changed. That's how heaven grows. And that is one of the ultimate ways that God is glorified through your life. As we wrap up, I want to just center us around a very important thought. We we couldn't end this passage without reflecting on this. Just as the disciples had to let Jesus wash them in order to truly belong to him, we too, we have to let Jesus wash us 
if we want to belong to him. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter, which was the key to unlock the meaning of this passage, unless I wash you, you have no part with me? Jesus looked at Peter and said, you need to be sanctified, you need to be purified, you need to be made clean. And Jesus would say the same thing to us today if we have not yet placed our faith in him. Earlier in the service, you saw five people baptized. Every one of those people went under the water. Uh, the Bible says that when you go under the water, it symbolizes your sins literally being washed away. That is Jesus cleansing us. He's purifying us. He is sanctifying us so that we are fit to receive the Holy Spirit in our lives and join his kingdom and be a part of his family. And if you want to belong to Jesus, all you have to do is say yes. Place your faith in him and ask him to come and make you new. Ask him to come and wash away your sins. There is no stain that he cannot get out. His blood covers it all. And today I would just invite you, many of us need to be inspired to servant-hearted leadership. And many of us need to be inspired to Christ-like selfless love. But others need to say, yes, Jesus, come. I'm going to receive your servant-hearted leadership. I'm going to let your blood wash me clean. I'm going to go under the water and come up a new creation. Let's pray, and then we'll respond as God leads. Lord, we thank you for your life of selfless love. I mean, every moment of the incarnation was service and just unbelievable sacrifice. But when you washed feet and you were preparing to lay down your life on the cross, we're just so inspired by the way that you led. Help us, God, in every area where we have influence in every place where we get to help set the atmosphere and shape the environment, help us to do it like Jesus. We renounce pride. We renounce greed. We renounce self-aggrandizement, self-promotion, and we pursue in the power of the Holy Spirit humility and selfless love, and we do it for your glory. May other people see Christ in us. We want that for every individual here. We want that for our church. We want the city to be different because of the life of selfless love that the creek lives out. And God, I know there are people here today who have not yet said yes to Jesus. They have not yet had those sins washed away. Might you do that work of grace, that life-changing, eternity-altering work right now in their heart as they call on the name of Jesus. God, come and do your great work, the work that only you can do. Amen. We want to open the doors to the porch, and if you are here today and you want Jesus to wash you clean, you want to be free of all your sin and all that shame, and you want to become a new creation, please come and meet us at the porch. We will help you uh, call on the name of Christ and make the, the best decision that you could ever make. For everyone else, this is our time to receive communion. Remember, this, this, this passage begins with a reference to the Passover. Thank Jesus for being the sacrificial lamb who shed his blood so that your filth can be washed away, and you can join his family. You have plenty of time, several moments. Follow the Holy Spirit's leading and meet with him right now in a moment of worship.